When I was a senior in high school, we had a debate on where the invasion was going to take place. You know, after I was a sophomore in high school when the war started when they bombed Pearl Harbor. And I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was and what it was. But anyway, uh, when I was a senior in high school, we were, had a debate on where the invasion would take place. And I was thinking about this when I was sitting on this landing craft out in the uh, um, English Channel waiting for our turn to go in. I was thinking here just a year ago, we were talking about where this was taking place. Boy, can I tell them now? <laughs> I was just, we were, I don't know how many miles, we were maybe a mile or two off the, off the beach. And uh, we were waiting for our turn to go in, which uh, I suppose I didn't, I didn't land until uh, uh, middle, middle of the after, early afternoon. But anyway, uh, we had a, a, a LCT and we had a bulldozer with a trailer and the bulldozer could have pull a pretty big trailer and they had that just loaded with TNT for the engineers. Uh, we were riding uh, attached to the engineer battalion. So. Uh, we rode in with him. There was maybe three, four of us from our company that they just put us on different ships. And we were all by ourselves on this landing, landing craft. And uh, we had two cranes, and there were jeeps and trailers on this. It wasn't a very big ship. We went across the channel rougher than a cob. And it was terrible. And, and then we sat off the beach, and this was kind of interesting. I could just sit there. I watched you could see the smoke, but it was far enough off we didn't hear too much. And we couldn't really tell what was going on. But uh, it was uh, just sitting there waiting for our turn. And then when, when we went in, uh, the uh, troops ahead of us, they were slaughtered on that beach. And, but some of them made it through. They got up behind and got in that trench, there was a trench along the ridge there, and, and from the trench there was trenches into these pillboxes, I don't know, there was 10 or 12 of them, and each one had a machine gun, and they, they all were able to cover a certain area of the beach. Well, and some of our guys finally got up there and threw a hand grenade into that pillbox from the backside. Then the, that part of the beach wasn't didn't have any bullets flying on it. And by the time I landed, they got gotten them all. So there was no machine gun fire on the beach when I landed. So I, I, I missed the, the tough part. I, but I was still on, landed on D-Day. And, uh, and that, you know, that was a big thing. Uh, no, we were 20 years old. I was 20 years old at the time. And we were, we were between us, uh, Kibetsi. I was there on D-Day, we said we could say the rest of our life. I was there on D-Day. So we knew it was a big deal, and it has turned out to be a big deal. And uh, it's, uh, I go on YouTube on the computer and show after show of the movies of landing on D-Day, and I can watch them any time I want to. And, uh, I haven't caught myself there yet. But anyway, uh, we, we, it was uh, uh, we were quiet because we had artillery that they were coming in. These uh, two cranes never got out of the water before they got them. And the, some of the jeeps and trailers made it. And then this bulldozer pulling that trailer full of TNT that got up on the beach and, and it was maybe 100, 200 yards away from where I was when they hit it. And that bulldozer and all this big man, that was a blast. That smoke went hundreds of feet in the air. That whole trailer was a TNT. It was a big trailer. And they got, if, they had, if they'd hit that on, when I was still, while we were still on the ship, I wouldn't be here now. Because that whole ship and all would have disappeared then. But that was a blast that I, like I never heard that well here again. Anyway, uh, then uh, we were pretty much on our own. Our, our unit was spread out in different ships, so I didn't see any of our guys from our company uh, until uh, late in the day or even the next day. 
but uh, our, we did set up an aid station and, and the Germans had a big tank trap like this and we had tanks with bulldozers on them and then had filled in and then but they had our aid station down in the bottom of one of these uh, uh, wheels there. But a lot of the, uh, the there were uh, boats on the machine gun stock, they had a little more time, they could put wood and right on the boat and take them out. We had a hospital ship parked out in the ocean and not too far away. And I helped load a boat there one morning, this was in the next day. And me and uh, Avalos, he was an Aztec Indian, uh, and him and I, he had already taken one load out on an abandoned landing craft, a Higgins boat. And then uh, I, he asked me to help him. Uh, load up there, and I, him and I loaded up another Higgins boat, cranked her up, and something got in the prop, the debris, busted that, so we had to take him off and walk around, put him on another landing craft, and just happened to be sitting there, and uh, that's kind of the way it went. And then the <clears throat> he finally got it loaded, he finally got it going again, this one took it out to the hospital ship. He did this all in all, we didn't have any Somebody from, from our company, and incidentally, the, our, we were, I was in the 393rd Medical Collecting Company. It was just a small unit, nobody ever heard of it, and, and the, we were attached to the 348 engineers, and they were the combat engineers that were uh, supposed to clear the beach there, so that they, uh, there was all that. Uh, stuff sitting up on, on the tide was in that was underwater and the tide was out it was exposed and uh, and they uh, would uh, uh, blow them up they had that's what the TNT was for there they had that to blast all these uh, obstacles that were in, in the water and uh, uh, that, that took some time and, uh, and by the time I got that they had several art the ship I was on we went right up to the land and I, got, I waded ashore without even getting my, my uh, uh, up to my knees in water. So that wasn't too bad. I didn't have to wade up. Like some of those poor guys, they were underwater and drowned. And, uh, but this, this was that much later in the day that uh, it was quite a bit easier when I landed. Uh, I, uh, the, I was always a firearms enthusiast. And, and uh, as a medic, you are unarmed in that, in that war. And the, uh, uh, I was two steps off of the um, landing craft, and here was hanging three 45s on the corner of a busted up landing craft. I scooped up those three 45s, and he was caught that in old man here. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I gave one to Wally and one to uh, Jack. Now these, these are names that come up from time to time. Uh, Wally, he was uh, from Moorhead, Minnesota, and he was uh, uh, with me. I met him at Fort Snelling, he was in front of me in a processing line. And Jack, I didn't meet until I got to the 393rd Medical Collecting Company, but he was from Idaho. But the three of us uh, kind of stuck together. But anyway, uh, uh, the things that happened in, uh, through the summer, see, we, the war moved away. And uh, the farther away the war got, the worse uh, uh, our overseers were to us, young guys that were doing all the work. And we, uh, so Jack and I and Raleigh, we got a little sick of it. And uh, that's when we, uh, 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 a flyer came through the uh, front office and one of our buddies was in there and he saw it, told us about it. But there was, a, there was a way for us to get out of this 393rd Medical Collecting Company by joining the 101st Airborne who had lost a lot of medics and they were advertising for medics to join the 101st Airborne, which the three of us did. And we went, uh, oh, it wasn't until about October that we uh, got back and got, uh, uh, went back to England for parachute training. But, uh, the farther away that war got, the worse they treated us there. We were pretty sick of it. And 
one, one night, uh, uh, the officers, they had a 60-man tent all to, one, all to themselves. Each one had uh, the wooden floor in it and everything. Uh, one night, one of our guys got drunk, and he went over in the ma Major's bed, in his, crawled in his cot, in his, in his, in his tent. And when he came home, he said, why don't you go sleep in my pot to see how you like it? <laughs> they didn't do anything too much, surprise, but they did, and that joy, joy, got their attention. And they, then we got 15, 16 men, tents for 16 men, but that's the time we headed for England for parachute training. Otherwise, we were two men to a pup tent out in the wind stand. It was getting kind of cool in France at that time. Been there all summer and, and then lived through all of them. So I was only in combat for a couple of days and it really amounted to anything. I know uh, our mail clerk, he was a guy from uh, uh, New York State, and I, I found him uh, on the beach. He didn't even fall over, he just crumpled down. And uh, they look a little different you know, when they die. But he had a hole in his head. I could put three fingers in. Yeah, he never knew what hit him. Piece of shrapnel. And they, uh, and we pulled out his dog tanks to make sure it was him. But I was pretty sure it was. It was. And uh, then another uh, uh, guy. Uh, uh, this was the next morning. We didn't get any sleep that first night. We were up all night working. And then the. Uh, and then it was just getting daylight and we were standing together there and doing nothing. And this guy down in the yelling and hollering, it was just getting light. He had come in during the night and he had stepped on one of those foot mines, blew the front half of his foot off. And uh, me and the three other guys went down there and we had to go into this minefield. They had a path through there and the guy said, oh, watch it, there's this one over there, watch this one over there. We went up there and carried him on. He was just the happiest of life. And because that was his, he, was gonna, he, he lost his foot. He must be going into that battle that he was headed for. <laughs> he was just happy as could be. And, and uh, uh, we carried him out of there and got him on a ship. He went out to the hospital ship. So, so there weren't too many things that happened. It's just that uh, all summer we worked there. And, When I transferred to the uh, 101st Airborne, well, then we went back to England and uh, took our airborne training, which was two-week course, real crash course. But there was over half of the unit that started that, that didn't make it all the way. They ran us pretty hard. And, uh, but they, uh, what a difference in people in this 101st Airborne compared to this medical collecting company. We were, we were out, outcasts in that company. So now we get over here. No, this is a combat out of the 101st Airborne. Boy, these guys, they looked up to the medics. And uh, I had that red cross on my arm here. I didn't have to worry about getting shot. Nobody could shoot at me because I had that red cross on here, you know. And, uh, and I uh, felt more like a spectator. Uh, and, and, uh, you really didn't have to mix it with the enemy or anything. I just took care of the wounded. Which, uh, and then the, uh, well, we, were, we were in England for a while. Uh, and then here, we, we had enough many medics there that uh, we ran the dispensary. Well, we had enough, so we only had to work every third day. And the officer that was in charge of us, he said, just keep in touch with me so I know, so I can cover for you. So I know where you're at, that's all, and you can do whatever you want. And that was a different attitude altogether. And uh, uh, we eventually got uh, uh, that part of it out of the way, and then we went to, uh, to back to France. We were flying out, we flew back to England, we flew back to France, and got with the 101st German was coming out of Holland from the Battle of Market Garden, and they were some of the wounded came in for, to the aid station where we were in England. And that was kind of interesting to see these guys coming back and, and the, the stories they had. It was really neat. And then they, uh, uh, when we got back to uh, France, and 
that we had, we had set up in an old army barracks, French army barracks, stone buildings, and then we had four men to a room then. between the 16th of December and the 17th, I was on CQ, and I answered the telephone, and that's when I heard about the stuff happening up at the big breakthrough up in the RBMs. And this uh, officer came in and said, well, we'll be going up there. And uh, he said, you ever been in combat before? I said, yeah, I was on Omaha Beach on the ED. I think that counts. And <laughs> well, anyway, uh, this is the 16th that they came through. On the 17th, we started getting ready. On the late, on the 18th, we headed up to Bastogne. And uh, open trucks, we didn't, it wasn't time to get a parachute jumping in, but we needed to get to Bastogne real quick because the Germans were heading for there too. And we beat them. And uh, uh, with a column of these, the, not these, uh, trucks that they would like you haul grain in here, open, they were open, right here they cover them with canvas, but it was a semi with a open coat and all get out and we all cramped in there and these guys had a, all their weapons with them because I didn't have it too much, I was a medic and, and uh, uh, they had, didn't have lights on the, on the, you had to go in blackout driving. But there was one long column, I have no idea how long it was, but from bumper to bumper with these big semis hauling the 101st Airborne up to Bastogne. And uh, I didn't think I ever even got into Bastogne, they just went around. And uh, I uh, uh, ended up on the north, about two miles north of Bastogne, and that's where we were surrounded. And uh, uh, I get off the, uh, the um, Semi truck that we were on there and we were on loading. <coughs> this Belgian came over and charades and stuff, told us we were already surrounded. And uh, he, uh, uh, this machine gunner, he had so much to carry, and I didn't have too much. So he threw away two cans of ammo, that's 500 rounds. And uh, I thought to myself, if, if uh, we're surrounded already. I don't want it to run out of ammo, so I carried those uh, ammo for him then. And, uh, because he had to buy the platform underneath for the machine gun and everything. And he set up in the pasture uh, out there, and we, uh, uh, me and the medic, we went in and developed an aid station. We moved into this house, uh, the name. Emil M-U-R, M-U-R, I don't know how you pronounce it, but Murmur, Emil Murmur and his wife, they were at this little stone house, they went into their living room and set up our aid station. And we were on the north part of the circle now, and, and then, uh, uh, the whole circle, probably, I think I heard, it was like 14 miles on the, all the way around on that circle. Uh, but, so it wasn't a very big circle, we were on the north, North end of it. And there was a little, little town of Long Champs, is where we set up. And then there was another town less than a mile away of Champs. And they ran a uh, four man patrol back and forth every hour. And on Christmas morning, they would patrol before our guys were coming back. And, and here the Germans were spilling out in the road. They were going to go across the valley and up into. Well, I didn't know it at the time, you know, when you're in combat, you don't know what's happening, you're happy. But I've read about it since they were going to go up and get behind that uh, headquarters up there, regimental headquarters. They were going to go up through the woods, it was about 200 yards farther up from where we were, where I was taking my foxhole. And they, uh, well, anyway, uh, for those. Patrol came back and the Germans were out. Well, our machine gunner was down in the pasture and he was able to keep them from going across the valley after he did it all. And then the, uh, the, I was sound asleep in this stone shed that they had hay in. And the hay was about that deep, deep. So it made a pretty nice bed. I was in my sleeping bag, sound asleep. And this guy, you know, I'm sitting there, 
get up right away. There were the higher Germans coming right up the road into town to where I woke up at Christmas party in 1944. And then we went out. I, would, I, I went with one squad and Jack went with the other squad. That's about all they could round up that were there to stop those Germans that were supposed to be coming right up the road. Well, our, our machine gun had hit it. Well, I went with one squad in, in the woods across the valley from where the Germans were. We could hear them talking over there. It was uh, maybe 200 yards across the flat on their little creek, ran through it. The road to the uh, champs was ran between there. That's where the Germans were coming up with our machine gun. It was in a pasture here. And he, could, he kept them from crossing there. Uh, but we were, oh, I suppose there was six or eight of us that were up there in the squad. We started digging in. If the case they'd come across, we'd be there. Well, uh, like I say, you don't really know what's going on in your attic. Well, our machine gunner, they had the machine gun up in the hills, and so they were dueling across this valley, and the traces were laid up the valley. The other way was pitch dark. It was, uh, uh, you know, that time of the year, it was light until uh, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, and this was 3 o'clock when this started. Well, we uh, were quietly dug in. Frost hadn't frozen the ground where we were digging. It wasn't too bad digging. And anyway, uh, uh, they never did come across because our machine gun had kept them. But the other squad went right down the road. They had a new lieutenant that wasn't too bright. And uh, <laughs> right, right where the tracers were going across this road with the building with his machine guns. And, uh, uh, and a German opened up on with the or Schmeiser, there's a submachine gun, or a burp gun, they call them, because they shot so rapid, it sounds like a burp. And anyway, this kid he must have been on point, and he was right. He, got a, he had his trench knife in his boot, and he had a, and a, a bullet, took the handle off that trench knife, another bullet went across his back, and this German was just maybe 15 feet into the woods there, and he opened up on him, and the bullet actually cut his suspenders off, and he had left a burn mark across the skin on his back. <laughs> he must have bailed out and rolled. And then anyway, two bullets, one took the handle off the knife, and the other one cut his suspenders off. And Sunday, Christmas Day, he was throwing his shirt up, showing anybody that would look a close call he had. And, and then they went up on the, uh, uh, turned around, went back, and went up on the hill. There was a, a long row of high ground. Ran, ran right into long champs. And they got up in this hill and they ran into a big German dragging a light machine gun. He was going to get behind our machine gunner. This is when I, uh, and they, they, they killed him right there. He never fired a shot. And then it got quiet over there. They, uh, my theory is that if he didn't start shooting, then they were supposed to run across this valley. Then they were going to run right into us. But, <coughs> They caught him before he started shooting, and the people left. The Germans sent them over there. We could hear them talking. There was over a couple hundred yards away, and they were dropping 81 million mortars. They had the mortars set up in the church in the little town of Long Champs. And this was the battle on Christmas morning, but this was our part of the battle. The main battle of daylight, 18 tanks came into this area, uh, maybe a mile away from where we were. And they went right through the, these were the, the guys that were next to us, and they were the, the, um, the gliders, people. 327. 327th, yes. And they wrote, uh, there was, they came right through their lines. The guys got down in their foxholes, and as soon as they got past them, they got up at their end ones and started picking them off that were troopers that were riding on the tanks. And uh, they had a, tank battle there, they knocked out a bunch of tanks, they knocked out some of our tanks. So this happened, I didn't even know about this until I read about it after, after the war, but they were just a mile away from where I was, in the same woods. And that they anyway, uh, by the, at the, <laughs> towards the end then, this is daylight now, the, the few tanks that were left turned and headed right for champs, and this guy, he'd done a little, hunting and stuff. He's going to teach him a lesson. He had a little cannon there. And the back end of the tanks are vulnerable. They got, that's where the motor is. 
and he isn't too well protected, so and he can put a round in each back end of the tank from the last tank, and, and I don't know how many there were there, but he knocked them all out from the back end. And the, the 18th tank ended up in the, right in the main street in the Champs, and apparently those guys inside looked out and saw they were all alone. We didn't know it because they all he shot them from behind all the time. And, uh, and they, uh, they bailed out and took off and didn't even turn the tank off and stood there in the middle of Champs running. And there was a few Germans that got into the houses in Champs and this, and they had to rout them out. This was a Christmas battle. But this, they came with 18 tanks, a whole big combat bunch. And these guys that we stopped, they were supposed to be up here too on, on the other side. They'd have me in between, but uh, the, our guys, our machine gunner actually kept them from hat for that from happening. They probably didn't know it when they came with those 18 tanks. So they lost the whole combat patrol, lost all 18 tanks, and all the men were captured or killed or captured. And, and the, the battle was over. That went pretty good. This was Christmas morning, 1944. By noon, it was over. And uh, then I. You know, the time difference between uh, Minnesota and uh, Belgium probably was like eight hours. Uh, about the time I got, I stayed in my pocket, so I got kind of sick of digging, so I thought I'd check it out once. And there was a little bush hanging over my pocket, and it was pitch dark when I started digging. But there was a, like a gooseberry bush or something was hanging over my, well, I got down in my pocket. The only time I got in there, in that foxhole, uh, and some bullets came zipping through there, the twigs were falling on, on me when I was down in the foxhole. That was the only time I got down in my foxhole. And I like to think it was, uh, you see, with the time difference in the home, it was the time uh, my mother was having uh, Christmas Eve. She always said a prayer, and, uh, and uh, I read the Christmas story in the Bible, and that's about that time. <laughs> I like to think she was praying for me. That's why I got in the foxhole that just at that time. And, uh, but uh, it was spent bullets. They weren't. Uh, they were subsonic, and they weren't shooting at me. They just happened to. Uh, they were shooting at somebody. They just happened to come through there. But uh, well, that is a little thing that happened there. Well, then actually uh, that. It was over. They, they, that whole combat thing. And now, in between, there wasn't really much going on. Uh, on the, where we were, there was the Germans were attacking somewhere on this 14-mile circle, pretty much every day. And, the, and then they'd always could get help so they could repulse them. Because they had to turn these cannons around to where they came in and stuff, I suppose. But yeah, I wasn't part of that. I just have to read about that, and, and uh, but um, uh, it was quiet there. When, when I was uh, didn't have too much to do there. Uh, I go out scrounging. We had to scrounge for food. We didn't only well, on Christmas Day. Actually, I got a D ration uh, on the twenty second day. Uh, over two hundred P uh, C forty sevens came in with supplies. Ammunition, food, and uh, I ended up with gay ration on Christmas Day for Christmas dinner. I was still in the woods there where I was doing my coxswain. And then I heard about, uh, I had a little blurb there sent with that about McCulloch saying nuts to the German commander when he uh, ordered us to surrender and be annihilated. Uh, now, this is two days later, uh, three days later actually, before I even heard about it. But that's where I heard about it anyway, when I was out in that woods. And then one, uh, there was one pretty nice house and the door was open. I went in, and nobody there. One of the nicest houses in town there. And uh, the guy must have been rich enough that could evacuate, call out when the Germans were coming back. But anyway, uh, I uh, went in. Uh, the house and poked around a little bit, and uh, I found a um, keg of uh, salt pork in the stairway. And the stairway turned to go up. And then I went up in the attic and I found a whole case of uh, 
Oh, yeah. And I carried it back to the aid station. To eat. And, uh, uh, I, was, I, I know I was probably kind of like the Vietnamese. I was like the second story man, the only one not have to worry about getting punished for it. <laughs> and then I, uh, one morning, I got this catch of chicken that was in this barns were part of the house. So I went in, but this one old hen, the other guys must have eaten too. And there was only one old hen, and she was so wild. I didn't you know, try to catch her even. <coughs> then she'd wake up the uh, people there. So I uh, I looked around, and uh, hey, there's a milk stool hanging on the wall over there, two by four, like that. And uh, <coughs> oh, I took the hard hat off my helmet liner. <coughs> out of that milk stool, took a couple of quarts out of that cow, mm -hmm. and uh, left. Didn't make any noise, and had fresh milk. Well, I was cooling that milk to drink, and now you gotta understand, here we were been surrounded for quite some time, and uh, uh, this uh, officer sees me cooling this milk, mm -hmm. and I told him where I got it, and that was raw milk. You're, that, that's uh, terrible taking a chance on drinking raw milk. And here we were surrounded out number 10 to 1. He's telling me how dangerous it is to drink raw milk. <laughs> <laughs> I drank it anyway. <laughs>
Well, then you wore on the time that the guy I rode out there with, he came up and stopped between us and the tanks, stood up in the jeep, hollered, you got any wounded down there? I said, yeah, we got one here. And, uh, and then he, the, the, the tanks were, didn't shoot at him then. But then they came around the trees, come up on this side, and I took this guy that had his wounded here and took him out and put him on the jeep. And then I was in plain sight of the tanks. And, uh, uh, Warren and this guy, they took off and they, they opened up on with the machine and like you hear the bullets slamming into that sheet. They must have hit a, um, a uh, transmission or something because it went zzzz. And they threw it in another gear and they made it. And they got out of there. And uh, uh, reading up on it, you see now, now the tanks knew right where we were. And because I was in plain sight, I couldn't be 100 yards away. You know? I went back down with the guys that were still there. there were maybe six people, maybe all there was. The one dead one and the, the wounded German and, and you know the guys. They had a radio there. They told us we should dig in and let the tanks go by. They found the infantry. Well, they forgot to tell the Germans because that lead tank came right up to the edge of there where we were. They knew right where we were then because they saw me go down there. Oh, they started shooting people. They shot the cat right through the hair, and one guy got a bullet through both cheeks of his butt, and then they went through the calf of his leg. And then they put up their hands and the shooting stopped, and I was just next in line there. And I was laying with my back to him because I was trying to squeeze into a foxhole that was too small for me that somebody else took. And we were trying to, you know, uh, did you know that when a bullet comes close to you, it has a little sonic boom? He has a real sharp track. And uh, uh, that mostly didn't go about <laughs> But uh, those machine doubles, crack, 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 because it was sailing right close to you again. And, uh, and we were down a little bit lower there. But anyway, we, we were supposed to dig in. Well, they, uh, then now, we were history now. Of course, there was four or five of us left that wasn't weren't wounded, but these wounded guys they had to get up and go out. And one German came out of that first tank and got down. He had one of our Tommy guns on his shoulder and he scrounged somewhere and uh, gave us a quick shake down and sent us down along the tanks. I was the last one out. See, I had that red cross. I, he should have told me, just you go ahead, stand, stay here, but he didn't do that. <laughs> anyway, I got uh, and captured Red Lion with the rest of them. And anyway, uh, halfway down, I don't remember which tank it was, he fired his big cannon that he had on that tank. And I was right, it was just maybe eight feet away from where my head was, but he was shooting past me. But the muzzle blast from that, they had that thing on the end, the muzzle brake, so they had that cannon and then the, the two crossways on it. And I blew the helmet right off my head. And, uh, and I just heard about the Melbourne massacre that day. And uh, uh, that crossed my mind that here we go. But I put the helmet back on and kept going. When I got down among the infantry, well, then it was, they uh, took my watch and went through my pockets and took whatever they wanted me to get much. But took whatever they wanted. And I had to, when I was trying to squeeze in this foxhole, I, I took I unhooked my medical bags. I had a medical bag on each side. That got in the way. And then all the commotion, you know, there was some stress there when we got captured. And uh, I forgot those medical bags, so I didn't have them with me. I could have used them later on. But the worst part was we had just gotten our candy ration I had Five Nestle Crunch, I didn't do one out of a six pack in, that, in the medical bag. And I left them laying there and couldn't go back. <laughs> Thought of that many times that winter when we were starving. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I walked down and, uh, and they were lining up uh, in the Column of Force, a whole bunch of our guys spread that were they captured out there in the field. And, uh, and I was going to go join them. But then I see this guy, so I went over to help him. I was down on my knees. And then our help got there. 
the very first shot from our side, from the, not they had to turn those cannons around or whatever. And then uh, uh, the very first shot to get, cut one guy right off where I could just as well have been when I stopped to help this guy and killed a whole bunch of our guys that were already prisoners. And, uh, and, that's, uh, and then I found out after the war that the, the, they wiped out all six tanks that had come through there. And that the ones that captured us, they didn't live to the end of the day. And but, uh, then these guys, well, then they finally got us off the battlefield. But uh, our artillery was blowing stuff. I mean, they had this fuse. I think it was a new fuse. But they did that before. And the shell would explode in the air. Air bursts. And they were, they were, we were very vulnerable to our own, our own gunners. Now we were amongst the enemy. And that was uh, uh, a whole new learning experience here. I had, they didn't get trained for any of this stuff. You know, I had to learn this on the, on the go here. Well, I had my Red Cross on, and, uh, and I uh, helped the wounded where I could, and with what I could, and that much. But, uh, and the first night, as a prisoner, I was uh, somehow got lost from the other guys, and uh, I was all alone amongst the Germans in the, the barn part of this house, and they were doing the same thing we were doing on our side, and, uh, they, and uh, I didn't see anybody watching me, and, uh, uh, and uh, but this, finally I curled up in some <coughs> straw that's a little harsh when right there, it was warm and trying to get some sleep. And then the morning, they, somebody took me to, a, to the church in town there, and they were holding a few more prisoners. Uh, and uh, so they, in, the, uh, in this church, nobody caught out early, the ushers had machine guns. <laughs> so anyway, and this is the, where I met uh, Frank Bragg, he was a, Stanton, Tennessee, he was from. And all right, people become buddies. It just happens, I guess. You know, him and I became buddies. And he was in the same second battalion like I was. But I, had, I didn't know him before. And he was from a uh, uh, southern gentleman. Uh, and um, uh, we got together. And anyway, we, this the whole time through the prison thing. We were with each other all the time. They moved us from this church. They took us to a uh, place where they were going to put us on a couple of <coughs> small vehicles, like pickups, plank on each side, and they were going to take us somewhere. And anyway, um, we, uh, we got on the Jeep, and this one, one guard, we had one guard for each vehicle, and the guard was going to get on the back end of our vehicle. I was sitting on the end. And he handed me his rifle, and then our guy took off, and he didn't get on board. And here I sit with his rifle, <laughs> and he went back and rode in the other vehicle until we stopped, and then he didn't got his rifle. And uh, well, it was uh, uh, I'd be in those uh, the firearms enthusiasts was one I'd never seen. It was, it was a rifle that they were copying our M1. Had a ten-round clip in it, a semi-automatic. I didn't even know what uh, what it was what it was called, but it had a name. I don't remember what it was. But that was the first one I'd ever seen. And here he hands it to me. <laughs> he rides in the other deep. But we were uh, ten rounds of ammunition was going to was only going to get us killed. And, but I remember that it was a second because it was my brother's wedding day in January that year. I should have been home at the wedding, but here I was out at, uh, walking through Germany, and, and we were, they put us up this night, we had a, a stockade that was built just like the uh, pilgrims, those poles were vertical, and just and then no roof on it, and that's where they had put us, and the guards, they had a, a little hut there that they had a stove in, they had a couple of us at a time to go in and warm up. I jogged all night long, I my feet from freezing. It was colder, and I know it was below zero. 
it was really cold. And in the woods where the, this was, they were sending these buzz bombs to England to see them taking off. Uh, it got interesting to be on the other side of the battle, you know, to see what's going on here. And, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the impress, the first impression I got was how bad a shape they were. If they had a truck running, they'd be towing another one, or they'd be pulling their stuff with a horse and wagon. And here they were flying it in from our side. So we, we, we can't be too tough here. We're gonna, we can't last too long the shape they're in here. Well, this is the thing that went through our head. And so all, all, all we had to do was stay alive, do whatever it took to stay alive. And they didn't feed us. Uh, they just promised us food, but we never got it. And, and, uh, I think the first food we got from, uh, after we were captured was from some Russian prisoners who worked on the farms. And they came in with a bunch of veggies and cooked, had it cooked, built a fire and cooked up the veggies. And they shared them with us. They called us Conrad. And, uh, we had, so they fed, fed them with the first food we got after we were captured. And this went on for days that we didn't get fed. And then uh, finally we got to a, Indoors, I think it was Flemersheim, Germany. And they, uh, this was uh, just a big old warehouse, which was here up like on the third floor. And they had a, oh, at least this big here. And they had straw for our bedding, for our bedding there. And uh, anyway, this, uh, uh, so we were indoors at least. It's not a cold. It was cold. This was January. It was cold. And uh, no heat in this place. That, uh, we had some ragged blankets that we could use. And uh, they, uh, uh, one thing I remember, and we went there all that long, but one thing I remember about this one here, they, they came with some, what they called coffee. And uh, I think it was just uh, hot water with some, with some bark in it or something, or sets or something, I don't know how to pronounce it. Even. Uh, but they called it coffee. And, I made the mistake of drinking it. In the uh, middle of the night, I had to go. Okay, now it's pitch dark. In the other air room, maybe as far as the kitchen down here, was a tub for facilities. But it was pitch dark, and the guys were laying. There was a path through. I got on my hands and knees, and I crawled on this path. And once in a while I'd bump somebody and they'd bitch at me and, and I'd keep going and finally got through the people that I could stand up and I had a mental image where this tub was in this other building. That was all that was in this room. So I could stand up and walk and I kept kicking, kicking this tub for the tub because I couldn't see it pitch dark. And I, finally I kicked that tub. Finally I could let go. Only I kicked that tub between the feet of a guy that was sitting on it. <laughs> and he had it be swore for five minutes without repeating himself. <laughs> and then we went uh, up towards uh, the Rye River and we uh, had a cement building that we were in for a week or so. And then when we were leaving there, they, another camp joined us. And, and these guys were really in tough shape. The two guys would be carrying one on their shoulders and arm around. And they, they, they couldn't they went, you know, that, that was a work camp. And they worked with the lift. And, uh, and they couldn't work. You know. Anyway, they joined us and we thought we had a tough man. We had a pretty good compared to those guys. And then here's where we crossed the Rhine River. This was at Bonn. And, uh, and we, I remember well, this Ryan River was big here, and I was wide, and there was still a ridge standing. We were going across the ridge. I, you know, the Patton and the Montgomery, they were uh, kind of a, they didn't like each other too much. And they were, well, each one wanted to get across the Ryan first. And I told the guys, hey guys, look at the right side here. But we're beating both Montgomery and Patton across the Ryan. Well, 
we live across the bridge here, and then they put up some boxcars. And uh, these boxcars uh, were the 40 and 8. Uh, eight horses are 40 people. And we had about 90 in there. Yes, washed in there. And just and it's locked, the wire shut on the outside. They just left it in a, in a uh, rail, rail yard. Fortunately, it was stormy weather, so our airplanes were not strafing these boxcars in the rail yards. I knew one, then he was in a boxcar locked in like that. And the straight one of our P 47s straight back. He had a 50 caliber bullet hole in the cap of his leg. Didn't break the bone, fortunately. But this year he showed it to me. Just healed up by itself. The bullet hole that night through the meat. You had to just put up with it. Uh, we finally got to uh, Stalag 12A. That was the first time that we had a name camp on that. We just were held, what if some, whatever, you know. And anyway, we got in this, uh, this uh, 12A. The, this uh, commandant had to give us the rule, camp rules, uh, the thing I remember. That he had an 82nd Airborne Sergeant who could talk German. So he told him what to say. Very handsome guy. He had his uniform on yet. And he must have been captured in either Holland or, or uh, Normandy. But, uh, uh, he was the spokesman for this commandant. The thing that he told us uh, for the ground rules if you so much as catch a wire on that fence, you will be shot. I'm pretty specific there. So, and actually, I stayed away from that fence. And this place where we stayed in this, uh, it, it reminded me of the barns at the state fair, rooms like that with like pens, and that and the cobblestone floor, wet cobblestone, and little straw, and that's where we laid in here. Well, after a little while there, well, we had with one thing that happened here was the Every so often, one of our P-38s would come in and dive onto the rail yard that was right outside this camp and drop one bomb. And uh, they get off about three shots and he wasn't going to hear them anymore. But the, they were a pretty fast airplane and, and that, that whole dive seemed to get, the sound seemed to get to the ground at the same time. What a roar. And they dropped that one bomb and away they go. And, you know, you shoot one down the line along. But it was just one, one P-38. They had to hold up our suit for a while there. Well, they lied a lot. I don't know if this was true or not. But anyway, they, they uh, uh, gave, uh, they take 10, 20 minutes at a time to another camp five days away. They had to walk for five days. And they take 20 at a time. And, uh, to get away from this meningitis thing. That's catching. And uh, well, Frank and I decided we'd join a bunch there. And uh, uh, they had three kids guarding us. Had for youth. They had each a rifle, one in front, one on the side, and one in back. And then there was 20, two columns, 10 in each column. That's how we walked through Germany. And uh, one time we were walking the, narrow streets and uh, a guy ahead of me, a, a hand came off with an apple in it from the hole in the, I think it was where they put mail in, and the, the guy in front of me got an apple. Um, they didn't dare, and there were people that would help us if they could, but they didn't dare. They were punished if they were out, did anything. And once in a while something happened like that. And, but the, the, and then on this side, uh, Another interesting thing that happened on this uh, five five day hike. The, uh, well, my buddy had lost his boots already, jump boots. He had a pair of German shoes. He had a blister from the middle of his foot to his ankle. I was Frank Graham. He had a. And, uh, then uh, one day I see this. Kid. <coughs> I don't remember which day it was. He was looking at people's feet. Well, I know he's looking for. He's going to get a pair of boots and trade. And I stayed around the other side of the guys and, 
and I stuck my slow feet in the slow that sucker didn't give up till he put his foot alongside the bike, shoot, and that's the ones he wanted. And I pretended I didn't know what he wanted, and I knew already a long time what he wanted. And finally, uh, I kept next first time, and he put the finger on the muzzle of his rifle on my head. Uh, that was pretty plain what he had in mind there. <laughs> So, but I still talked him into waiting till the day was over. I didn't want to lose those boots. They were a good pair of boots, and they fit my feet from my buddy Frank. And his feet were blistered all up, and he had to walk in many ways. But anyway, uh, we kept going here, and all of a sudden we were out on the prairie here, and, and some of our planes flew over. And I could see the guys sitting up there. I know they could see us. And, uh, and uh, they can certainly figure out two columns with the dark buttons. And here they um, opened our bomb bays. Of course, we were grumbling, you lucky suckers, you go home and get a good meal and a good bed. And we were be out here in the snow. And uh, anyway, uh, they opened their bomb bays and dumped their load on this little town that we got to walk through in a few minutes. That was not good. The go snake around these big bomb craters in the street. The town was off to the side of the road went kind of past, and there was a, like a park in there between us. But anyway, this German yells at us, look, you Yankees, son of a bitch, I kill you if I get my hands on you. Nobody said a word. This was not the time to be lucky. <laughs> well, we made it through. Most kids couldn't have done anything. But apparently, uh, somebody that was from this town, they took out after us. And I didn't know, we didn't know it at the time, but they caught up with us just as uh, we got to where we were supposed to spend the night that night. They had places each day to spend the night. And this, uh, uh, these two bigger kids, and they were uh, all armed, maybe six of them. And they started hitting and yelling and kicking and trying to pick a fight. There was no doubt in my mind that they were uh, wanting somebody to do something to make give an excuse to kill somebody. No doubt in my mind. And I let uh, uh, watched them for a while. They didn't bother me personally anyway, but when they were, they were, they were really getting sticky. And I closed my eyes and I prayed God to help us. I opened my eyes, and the ring leader of this bunch of thugs was getting a number of 12 right in his rear end. The guy that was in charge for, of us for the night came out. He must have had some fault. He kicked that guy right in the rear end and run those bunch off. And then run my guy that wanted my boots. So here, <laughs> I had my boots yet. Never saw that guy again. So he, this guy put us up for the night, and we went on the next day with three, three new kids for guns. They traded, new, we only were with us for one day, and they didn't go any further. And we got three new ones for the next day, for five days. And boy, when we finally get the Bad Orb, that's the name of the town nearest where the prison camp was. It's called like 9B. And we went, uh, uh, there was a long hill and boy, our guts were dragging. We were walking for five days, and we had to go up this long hill, and there was a tank with some water in it. I was thirsty. I had to go and took a drink out of there. I, they told me, the, the guards told us, don't drink that water, you get some shice of it. No, But I drank it anyway, and that never bothered me. Uh, and, uh, but but well, we were just beat. And then we take or turn off this road and go up and here's our star like 9B. And that was up on the hillside there. And then they had, had a place outside the prison gate that they uh, gave us a shake down again. They take everything out and lay it on the table. And they, they registered us in. In fact, I went on the internet and I found the, the, uh, or my name, me and Frank's name, on this roster. And from that prison camp. And, but anyway, here we were on 9B now. This, is, this had to be uh, late February, early March. Was, uh, we weren't there very long. And uh, that was uh, uh, 
And this was uh, the last camp we were in. Uh, and here we laid on the floor. We had a blanket and a half per man, and we laid right on the, on the hard floor. And uh, we pooled our blankets so we could get some blankets underneath and then some on top to stay warm. And then we all slept together under this, these blankets. And, uh, and uh, uh, if one turned over, we all had to turn over. But anyway, I, this, uh, there was a, a uh, little room. This was between the two ends of the barracks that they had a separation there. And there was a faucet in there that had a brought cold water and had cut the groove in that so it wouldn't freeze. And it bubbled. And it, uh, it uh, sounded, well, it caused me to have this grieve over and over again, which is like a bubbling in a frying pan oil. I could just lay there and I could just see my mother down by that wood stove. Frying eggs, they called me down for breakfast. And the ball of one didn't sound like that. And then this recurring dream. And then you, I, I'd wake up to the nightmare I was living. Pretty soon we could hear the war coming our way. Now this is the end of, of uh, March. They either you couldn't even cross to Ramagan Ridge in. I'm never moving in. And the, and the, the, uh, what, the commandant, our commandant of this camp, left one of our guys uh, listen to their radio, their German radio. And every day, the Allies are repulsed, but they're always about 50 miles closer. <laughs> repulsed, but they're always repulsed. And the com our commandant let one of our guys loose to go make contact with our people. Uh, we knew we were coming, we could hear them coming, see. Guards had left the towers by now, it seemed. They, they, there were no more guards with machine guns in their guard towers. They took off. The commandant uh, offered them to run them, or they could stay and be captured or, or leave by their choice. Our commandant at the camp, he stayed and, and was captured. I never, I never did see him, but, but anyway, uh, the guards were gone. So somebody had already dug a hole under the fence right behind our barracks. It was right next to the woods. And the, the barbed wire, you know, with the coils, just like you see in the pictures, and somebody had gone and dug down to the fence there, the, the grass. And I was standing there talking to this British soldier. And uh, uh, he, uh, he said, uh, uh, I told him, uh, he says, as soon as it gets dark, he's leaving through there. He, and he, I said to him, we've got a guy out there making contact with our troops. You'd be smarter to stay here and wouldn't let them come to us. And he says to me, I was this close to liberation once before, four years ago in Africa. <laughs> Boy, did my argument go downhill fast. <laughs> and and uh, well, anyway, uh, I don't know if he had left or not, but we were, as we were standing there uh, talking, that was down the hill, maybe a hundred yards, two hundred yards. Bang, bang, <coughs> bang, bang. There was a little duel going on down there, behind the trees. This is in the woods. I never knew how it came out, but <laughs> there was just a hundred yards down the hill there, from below the fence of the prison camp. And uh, <coughs> well, no, this was uh, Easter Sunday. I didn't know it at the time. But, uh, Going back, that was Easter Sunday, and uh, uh, we knew they were, this guy was out, we knew they were awfully close, we knew they were coming, we didn't know when, but boy, it was getting exciting. And uh, the next morning, then, it was one of those uh, throws at night, so just, we heard we'd been walking, it was all black dirt, and they had the uh, uh, it was white where the frost was, and as soon as the sun hit it, it melted. So it was white and black, white and black, and then moved as the sun. So it was warm, getting warm like it is now, you know. It's this time of year. So anyway, the, uh, uh, we were uh, uh, getting excited there, and I, I had gone out, and I had gone back to the barracks for something. And when I went back out, here comes that column of tanks right down Main Street. This kid that they let out to make contact, he was riding that lead tank with his 
his arm around that new cannon on that tank coming right down Main Street. And just like that, it was over. I didn't see it, but the, the guys told me that they went through that prison gate without even looking. There was maybe six uh, Sherman, uh, Sherman tanks, Patton's tanks, and they came way out ahead of the main force, but left all these little towns say, but sheets out in the street now because they didn't want to play shot up at this station again. But now this is uh, uh, April 2nd, which happened to be my 21st birthday, that these tanks came down that street. Strange things happen in wars. Here, uh, all of us, I see this guy, I knew, I know him from someplace. He was fat. Uh, our rest bearers, their pants were tight on their legs, we noticed. And ours were all loose and sloppy because we lost so much weight. We had no way to lose weight. But my jump boots naced about this wide and they lapped over on their leg. And, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, these, this, here this unit that I used to belong to at the, uh, Normandy, the 393rd Medical Effect Collecting Company, they set up shop right outside the prison gate. And <laughs> the first time we discovered out the first time we came, I went out and had a greasy pork chop uh, with, uh, on the, there while I was waiting to get taken out of there. And then I went to the, uh, my friend out said we could go wherever we wanted now. He said, oh, it is freedom. You couldn't believe the feeling we had. You know, I go wherever you wanted. I walked out here. There's a little trailer house with a red cross on it. They had coffee and donuts, and they had a stack of D-mail forms. If you older folks probably know what the D-mail forms were. This are where you write a letter, and they take a picture of it and send the film back to the States, and then you make a print of the letter. And they had this and everything on it. So, uh, so I, hey, I'm going to write my folks a letter here. And so I wrote uh, uh, my folks a letter, told them what happened. And uh, of course, I always wonder if it ever gets. And anyway, my dad, he had started uh, when he was semi retired, and he took the job to pick up the mail at the train depot in Welch. And then you bring it over to the post office in the Welch, is half a mile away or so. You do that every day, bring you a couple bags of mail. Well, this letter was in one of those bags one day. <laughs> See, I was only, I was missing in action, as all of my folks knew. Nothing else, just missing in action. And then, here's Dad, sitting there like we did every day, wait for them to sort the mail. And uh, the postmistress told me this. She said, I came to your letter. I come over to it just thinking about it. And pulled it up. I said, I think there's a letter from Kim. All these people knew me. My dad was there and put it in the mail carrier. And she said, he got a little tear in I must her to read it to him. And I don't know if you got a copy of the letter. I didn't bring any with me, but I got a copy of the letter. Uh, and uh, on uh, my birthday, we had a little party at the cafe in one Mingo area, 57. And I had, I've got copies I can, so, I, so I can tell people what I'm celebrating. And I've got letters as part of that. Uh, and, uh, so if you come over there on the next Tuesday, I'll be celebrating my liberation and birthday. And uh, I can get all of them. But anyway, that's uh, now, now we're in a different situation, boy. Now, this uh, officer gets up, makes a big spiel, welcoming us, you know, and, and then he says, We'll have you boys home in 30 days. We just laughed. It seems so impossible. <laughs> anyway, uh, I didn't get out of there until April 5th. And that's when I wrote, wrote this letter to my folks. And I also wrote a letter to Jack. He was with me out of the battlefield where we were captured. And I didn't know whether he got killed or whatever. He, but I wrote a letter to an old address anyway. Well, he, was, he made it all the way. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I really, uh, the three guys that joined the paratroopers, 
to get out of this other outfit, two of us ended up prisoners, and what, Jack made it all the way. And then we went down the hill, or the ones that we climbed up on, and they had a, a shower, they had a bonfire, and a, and a shower, outdoor shower. We took our clothes off and put them on the fire, got a shower and got some clean clothes, got on a C-47, flew all the way back to La Havre, France, from the middle of Germany, in just a few hours, you know, a couple, three hours, I don't know how long it took. But it was these young kids that were flying these airplanes, they were maybe 18, 20 years old. They were horsing around, there was three of planes there, and they were horsing around. I looked out the window, I could saw a rabbit down on the ground, and I was thinking, you dumb fools, don't fool a screw up now. After I get this far, I don't do it. <laughs> screw up now. <laughs> We got to La Harbe, and then we, we had a um, uh, they had a tent house, tent uh, city there. We called it Camp Lucky Strike, and, the, and the, most of the people there were prisoners, ex-prisoners, because we were there were getting more and more out. But I think we were some of the first ones, because they always had a, a big spiel welcoming, welcoming us, and all the food you want, you have to worry about food here and there. For we, long they were scratching for food, we'd clean them out. Everybody was so starved. By this time they could hold food. At first, everybody got sick. Just uh, completely exploded. Uh, and threw up and pooped everything out. And it was a terrible mess, but that only lasted a few days. By the time I got on the boat, I could hold food. And we were in this camp lucky strike for, I don't know, a few days. And then we'd get on the Oh, I'm standing there by the rail in this boat, and uh, just enjoying, here we are, boy, golly, we're on our way across the ocean, heading home, and the sailor comes up, real apologetically. He says, uh, I know you guys aren't feeling good, but we got to have some help in the galley. And when we were starving, Everybody said, boy, if I ever get a chance to get on KP. <laughs> <laughs> I also said to the cinema, just keep it quiet, I'll get you a crew. And we, uh, I got my buddies together and told them what happened. And we went down to the galley to have a meeting with them. They told us, if you guys will work till midnight, we'll break out the homemade ice cream. <laughs> and we were so protein starved. But whenever they came out, we cleaned it up. The sailors would just stand there and watch us eat. And then we had a, yeah, it was just the contrast was so different. We could go into the stores, take whatever we wanted. I had one of those P38 can openers. And I could open a can of peaches and eat the whole can, can of pears or whatever. What I wanted to eat, I could, nobody <laughs> yelled at me. And, and, and then, and then uh, by the time I got across, by the time I got home, I didn't want that tough anymore. I, I just really came down from that. Those sailors, they had food in that boat. But, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I uh, got to Fort Snelling. We got to New York and we took a, a, a uh, uh, train to Fort Snelling. And I had a sister living in Minneapolis, so I went and spent a little time uh, and visited her. And, I called my folks, told them, I well, want tomorrow I should be coming home sometime. And I, and I, I just had to see that far away when we were in Minneapolis, unfortunately. And that's why I decided to hitchhike home. So I took the streetcar out to Inver Grove as far as it went, you know. And I walked up that hill, got a ride right away, and I suppose it was down to the north coast to Haste. I had to get over 61, I had to get to the Welsh church there, and, the, and there I, could, I got a ride at the, uh, uh, got two rides to the Welsh church. Well, was this fun, that was <laughs> and on my own. Then I, this guy took me up, and he lived halfway to Welsh, I, he took me that far. Then I had to walk the last two miles. Well, oh boy, that was stepping pretty lively on this. I had a great feeling. <laughs> to be walking home like this, you know. And anyway, I get down in Welch there and turn the corner by the store and, and the cafe before I got to the bridge. There's a couple of farmers that knew me all my life. 
this one farmer says, you're stepping pretty lively for a dead man. <laughs> but I must, I, must, I must be riding pretty high if I stop trying to get across the river and you're on our own land. And I, I'll take a path across the schoolyard where we used to cut it. We had a sharp cut along the slough there. Oh, that was just so great to walk that last two miles. And, and then uh, I can see the folks up there. That's about it, guys. Yeah. That's that is really, really a great story. Okay, how old were you? 21 years old. 21 they are liberated. 21 years old, and, and that's the kind of people that go out and fight for our freedom. God bless you, Ken, and thank you all for coming.